Hello and good evening, everybody, and welcome. Also, welcome to our Facebook audience as well. Uh, so thank you for joining our webinar tonight. For those who have not heard as of yet, um, we have officially merged Fortune Homes team with Yan Lam Academy. So expect to see this more often. Uh, so yeah, so tonight we're, we're gonna be discussing how to market for deals and what branding and lead generation strategies you can use that will help you get those deals. So yeah, marketing is especially lucrative, is especially lucrative for this, so keep in lookout. Um, so first off, to go over a few ground rules, if you have any questions at all during the presentation, uh, please be sure to type them in the chat box and we'll get to them in the order received at the end. So please stick around for that. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Please allow me to introduce the gentleman who was responsible for all of this, for going out of his way and being willing to help every person that he can, even during the pandemic, whether it's for real estate advice or general. He never lets any problems or obstacles get in his way and he loves to have fun, of course. And he also knows 110% about the facts and he makes a heck of a lot of money in real estate. But the best thing, my personal favorite, he's very down the earth. Please welcome Mr. Jan Lam. Jan? Nicholas, uh, thank you first for the warm welcome. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. The floor is yours. All right. Great stuff. Well, first of all, Happy New Year to everyone here uh, logged on to Click Meeting, and also Happy New Year to those who are watching us uh, via our Facebook live stream. And uh, guys, this is going to be an exciting year. And I mean, it can't get any worse than 2020, right? But you know what? Where, where people see crisis and disasters, others see opportunity. And I want to share with you guys uh, what kind of opportunities I personally see in real estate. Um, through you know, just getting deals, you can do a fix and flip, wholesaling, or buy and hold. But there's always opportunity, guys, regardless of whether the market goes up, goes down, goes sides, you know, whatever it may be out there in the whatever the news media is advertising. There's always an opportunity for those who know how to look for opportunity, and also those who are educated enough to know how to take advantage of the opportunity once they see that. One of the first things you want to do. Is, is train your eye to be able to recognize opportunity and also finding out how to source these opportunities, okay? So that's why our topic tonight uh, that we're gonna go through is really how to get started legally and then how to get started with marketing for great deals, okay? One of the biggest challenges I hear from time and time again from other investors is how the heck can I find a deal where the numbers make sense for me? And that's the number one challenge of real estate investors, especially folks who are brand new and not really knowing how to target their marketing campaign just yet. So tonight, we're going to go through exactly just that and how you can target your campaign so that way you can get incredible deals for whatever exit strategy you may want to do in real estate investing. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, now again, for those who don't know me, just coming on for the very first time, um, I've been doing real estate for the past 10 years, a little over 10 years now, and we've done a lot of deals. We've trained a lot of students, hundreds of students in the past several years, and we've created a lot of success stories from those who are following our system. So this goes to show that our system truly works because no matter if you have experience in it, real estate investing or no experience in real estate investing, the system works for you and uh, as long as you work the system, okay? So let's go ahead and get into the meat and potatoes on how to get started. Number one, whether you're doing fix and flip, wholesaling, or buy and hold, you're still gonna need to create a company, okay? What I encourage you to do is not buy any property under your own personal name. You're setting up yourself for legal disaster if you're buying it under your legal name. So form an entity uh, called an LLC. Now, why an LLC? Because it limits the liability you have in the marketplace in case someone tries to sue you based on that property, whether it be a tenant, whether it be a contractor, whether it be someone who just happens to walk by your property and slip and fall, you know, they can sue you for anything. We live in a very litigious society, but to create a limited liability company will protect your personal assets in case that were to happen. Okay. In addition to that, once you create your limited liability company, you can go on the irs.gov website and create a tax ID number for that company and that's completely free, okay? After that, uh, you now have the tax ID number. You now have the registration for your LLC in the state that you live in. Now you're going to want to hire an attorney to draft up all the documents you need to get started. And typically, in order to open a bank account, you're going to need an operating agreement, which technically shows how you're going to operate that LLC. Who are the members? Who are the capital contributors? Who's going to be getting distribution? The, the legal documents are literally, uh, the operating agreement is going to give you the legal know how on what to do and how that entity is going to be operated by you and all all the members on that company. All right. Also, of course, in order to be in business, you got to have a business bank account. Now, I encourage you, once you have all these in order and your documents, go to a community bank to open a bank account. Now, why do we choose bank, you know, a community bank and why why not a national bank? You know, why not Wells Fargo? Why not 
Bank of America. Why not, you know, Citibank? And the reason why is because when you're starting off small, going to a community bank gives you the luxury of negotiating better things uh, with the, the direct lender because the bank is small enough for you to talk directly to the actual lender. And you don't have to call a toll free number and wait and hear elevated music before you get any kind of service or help. In a small community bank, once you get enough volume and a nice portfolio going in real estate, you can easily get the cell phone number of the vice president of lending and you can go ahead and negotiate terms and different things that you have going on so that way you have more of a VIP experience okay in addition to that you're going to need to establish credibility when you first start off I remember my first year starting off it was pretty rough you know I did everything I knew was correct but one thing I lacked was credibility. No one knew who Nyan Lam was. No one knew who my real estate companies were. And I was just fresh out, you know, uh, and just trying to make things happen. But eventually, later on down the road, as you start doing deals, you want to establish credibility. You want to establish a presence in the marketplace. So that way, when someone says your name, they know who you are. It's like, oh, yes, so-and-so is a real estate investor. And they've bought so many deals in the past year. And by the time you get to that route, you know, by the time you get to that status right there, you'll be having deals come to you whether you like it or not because people want to work with those who have a good reputation and those who can perform when it comes to buying a piece of property. All right. Now, once you get our set up, how do you find deals now? Okay. We're going to talk about marketing for deals. What are the different ways to market and identifying good opportunities? Well, first of all, you can do direct mail. All right. Now, I'm sure you guys have gotten some things in the mail before that you never asked for, but they're trying to sell you something, whether it be getting your gutters clean or getting your HVAC service or getting some lawn care done. You got some kind of direct mail postcards in the mail at some point in time in your life as an adult. OK, well, guess what? As real estate investors, they do the same thing. But here's the thing, guys. In order to for this to work, you got to do massive numbers of direct mailing and you got to be consistent in the same neighborhoods that you're going to be targeting. You don't want to target one neighborhood this month and then target the next neighborhood another month. You want to stay focused because when the first time you see a direct mail flyer, you know, people probably throw it out. But once they see it a second time and a third time and maybe a fourth time, now there's that familiarity to where there's instant credibility. The first time they throw it out, it's not credible. But the second time they see it, it's going to be familiar to them. So because it's familiar to them, they have now credibility in your company. Okay. So you want to target. And of course, you never know who they're, you know, when they're going to be ready to sell a piece of property. You know, you know, everyone's lives is very fluid, it's very variable, it's very dynamic. And you may not need to sell the house this month, but they may not need they may need to sell the house six months from now. Okay. So direct mail. And of course, in your direct mail, you definitely want to make sure you have some kind of call to action. In this case, you go to a website or go to a phone number so that way they can contact you and um, you can give them a cash a cash offer. All right. Next is referrals. Okay. Now this is one of by far the cheapest way to get a deal. And what I mean by that is that you don't have to spend any money marketing other than your time and sweat equity of meeting people. Everyone here who has who is over 18 years old is considered an adult. As an adult, all right, you you know you know at least 10 people in your network, okay? Whether your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, whatever they may be, okay? If you don't know 10 people, I got to tell you something, you got to get out more, okay? Get out more even with the pandemic, you got to meet some people, whether it be virtually, online, social media or whatever, but meet some people. And then you got to ask them a simple question. Hey, Mr. So-and-so, you know, a good friend of, you know, whatever, mom, dad, uncle, aunt, whatever. Do you know anyone who needs to sell their house in the next 90 days? And if so, can you please refer them to me? Because I'm, I'm focused on buying houses right now. And we're looking for people who need to sell their house quickly. Okay. And here's the amazing thing, guys. The people you know may not have a house to sell, but someone they know may have a house to sell. So it's not about who you know, it's about who those people know and those people know and those people know that gets you the quality of leads that you need to succeed in real estate business. Okay. So, I mean, here's a, one, a, a wise mentor once taught me that you're seven phone calls away, no matter who you are, seven phone calls away to getting access to someone with significant importance inside the White House. Okay. So if that's, if that's true, which it is, then you're literally seven phone calls away from getting access to an incredible real estate deal. As long as you follow the the script, as long as you follow and and uh, and network through other people that you know, through the people they know, and so forth, until you find someone who needs to sell a house right now. Okay. 
Also, signs. I'm sure you've seen these before. These yellow and black signs that says we buy houses, cash as is, and then there's a phone number, all right, and different medians, different telephone poles, and different places inside the marketplace, whether in North Virginia, D.C., or Maryland. You know, you're going to see a lot of these signs out there. Why do you keep on seeing them, even though they look so horrible? I mean, I'm, it's not the most luxurious way to advertise, and it's probably not the most credible way to advertise. But you know what? The reason why you see them over and over again is because it works. What I found out, guys, is if political um, candidates can put bandit signs into the medians and they work, why can't you put the same thing out there and have it work for you and your business, okay? It's got to be working. That's why people are using it. So these are not that expensive to do. You could probably buy 100 bandit signs for a, for a couple hundred dollars, and then you can choose to put them wherever you want to. And, of course, you know, you're not going to be able to... You know, uh, I'm, I'm sure once you put banner signs up, they're going to go missing every now and then, okay? So that's why you want to buy a lot to replace them in a time fashion uh, so that way you don't miss any traffic in then any particular area you're going to put it in, okay? In addition to that, online, you know, we live in the 21st century. Everyone globally today is connected. So can people search you on Google? Do you have a website? Can you put a posting for free on Craigslist? Can you put a posting up on Instagram or Facebook saying, you know, I'm looking to buy houses for cash. If you know anyone who needs to sell their house quickly in the next 90 days, please refer them to me and I may give you a 1000 up to a $1,000 referral fee. What if that means? See, everyone loves free money, right? So if they know someone who does sell the house, they refer to you, you cut a deal. Why not write them a check so that way they can do it again for you? Because I'm sure if they found one, they'll find another one for you on your behalf, okay? These are some easy ways. For you to market for deals. Remember, it's not all about who you know. It's about the people that know others and who know others know others who need to sell their house right now. Okay. Now, let me, you know, once you get these leads, now these are leads that come in. Okay. Now, how do you know when a lead actually will lead to a good deal? All right. First of all, when those come in, you have to qualify the seller, the homeowner, in certain categories, all right? Are they ready to sell now? Or are they ready to sell later? Are they still in denial? Or has reality sunk in, okay? So here's the thing that you want to qualify your sellers with, all right? When you're asking questions, you got to ask yourself, are these people in need of immediate cash? Now, whether they need cash for whatever, okay, it doesn't matter. They have a huge need for cash, whether it be unpaid medical bills or whether it be whether it be a sick family member who needs ongoing medical treatment, all right, or maybe they have unpaid debts or whatever they may be, they need to cash now sooner than later. So if they have immediate cash and their only asset is real estate, they want to sell that piece of real estate really quickly without any hassle and get money to the bank as fast as possible. So who do you know or know they people know that sellers they have sellers that have immediate they need immediate cash. All right. How about homeowners who do not have immediate resources to maintain their property? Maybe they own a piece of property here locally, but they live long distance because of a job relocation. Or maybe they had a rental property here locally, but they don't live locally anymore. And now the tenants tore up the place and they don't have the cash resources to fix it up to rent again or fix it up to sell. So they need to sell the property as is. And, they're don't, and they definitely don't want to fly back here to deal with it. They want to move on with their life. OK. Also. Maybe they, they simply don't have the expertise to make the home retail ready. I've known a lot of people who want to call DIY, do it yourself, all right? They try to fix everything themselves only to find out later that when they put the house in the marketplace, in, in the market, and they get a contract, a home inspection is done showing that everything that they did DIY was done incorrectly. So now they need to hire a professional licensed contractor to fix all the mistakes that they made because they weren't experienced. Now, it may have been good enough for them, but it's not good enough for the home inspector. And they want to prevent that from happening, okay? Next, all right, how about the sellers who don't have a desire or the time to do additional a traditional sale? Maybe they're so embarrassed of the condition of the property that they do not want to put it on the open market to where on Zillow or Redfin or HomeSnap, there's going to be pictures of the mess inside their house. Or maybe the agent does an open house and now the, the nosy neighbors come by and look at the the you know, the disrepair of the house, the junk, the hoarding, all the issues of the house is now in the public world to view. So if the seller wants to avoid all that embarrassment, they want to close and work with a person like you, like us, who are investors, will buy it as is, off market, and no one has to see inside the house in the public except for you, okay? So those are the people that you want to target. Now, all these things here lead to what we call a motivated seller. Motivated sellers should be the second 
the, the most important vocabulary word in your <laughs> in your uh, in your mind when it comes to real estate investing. Is a seller motivated or not? If they're not motivated, then they're probably not going to give you a good deal. You see, motivated sellers in anything, whether it be a, a piece of real estate, whether it be a car, a furniture, whatever it may be, if they're motivated enough, they will give it to you at a huge discount, if not give it to you for free. I'm sure you see on Craigslist where they have tons of good looking furniture giving out for free as long as you pick it up because they no longer want it. They're motivated at getting rid of it. Okay. Same thing with junk cars. Well, cars may not work anymore. They'll sell for cash. And then if you have a good mechanic who fixes it up, now they can go ahead and make it drivable again. So the same thing is, you know, the same thing with real estate. When the house is in disrepair or the person needs immediate cash, they become motivated enough to sell to you at a discount as long as you give them a value proposition of closing it fast, require no home inspection, require no appraisal, and you close in two weeks or less. All right. All right. So what types of deals out there can lead to motivation? All right. That one of the areas that I love is probate. Probate. You know, what is this? Probate. The process is not different in every state, but generally it's administering the assets of a deceased person by the heirs. Um, so that way they can liquidate everything owned by the deceased person. So most of the time it's real estate and cars okay, and vehicles. OK, so real estate, we can easily help. So, you know, what kind of things can we do here? Well, the value in working with us, if someone has a piece of real estate owned by a parent or owned by an uncle or an aunt who recently passed away and they now control it because they're the heirs, the value of our service is that we will buy the property as is, where is. Now, for those who are new, what does that mean? When you buy it as is, that means if the defects are known or unknown, they are not liable for it. If you don't sell it as is, whether the defect is known or not, the seller is still liable for that defect under certain laws in the state where the property sits. So by buying it as is, where is, depending on, you know, it, it, no matter if there's junk in the house or there's stuff everywhere, doesn't matter, okay? They don't need to do anything. They will sell it to you as is right there without cleaning the house, and it's up to you to take the risk to fix it up to sell it to a retail buyer, Okay. Also, the value of your service is that you're going to offer cash or cash equivalent. Now, whether you have cash in the bank or not, it doesn't matter. You're giving a cash offer, and you're going to raise the money later on through a hard money lender if you're going to fix and flip and also other private investors, okay? So just because you have enough cash in the bank to buy the house should not stop you from making a cash offer. So many times I've made cash offers, all right, and literally – <laughs> the cash offer, it says cash equivalent. And, you know, we'll put it on the contract and then we'll raise the money later because the deal is so good that most capital investors in our network will want to put their money into the deal so that way we'll buy it cash and really quickly. All right. In addition, they're going to get no hassle, no hassle whatsoever, no home inspection, no appraisal, no mortgage underwriting. You're going to buy it like it's cash and they will not have to worry about any kind of uncertainty because whatever your contract says, it's going to close in two weeks. That's exactly what's going to happen. Also, no contingencies, fast closing, and most importantly, there are no commissions by real estate agents. Most people who do a traditional sale, the agents will charge 6% commission. So if they're going to sell their house for $300,000, 6% of $300,000 is $18,000 that they're saving by working with you instead of a real estate agent. So there's the perks of working directly with the investor. Now, how do you find these leads? All right. Well, every county and every city jurisdiction has a process at the clerk's office to record probate and other legal documents. All right. So court records will have records of properties just recently going through probate in the last several months. In addition to that, now it might be sad to go through this, but you can go through obituaries to see who recently passed away in your area in the last month and identifying whether or not they own real estate and who the survivors are. And you can contact the survivors of the family to see if there's any real estate that you can help them with. Estate attorneys, all right? If you know anyone who knows an attorney, ask, do you know anyone who handles estates, all right? You can reach out to them and say, hey, listen, I work exclusively with, um, with estate attorneys who help liquidate assets for those who have gone through probate who recently passed away. If you have anyone who needs to sell their piece of real estate quickly to, to, to uh, close out all their legal issues and clear out their books, please refer them to me because I can close quickly and you will not have to hire an agent. So that way you as an estate attorney can most likely make more money in the estate because there's more proceeds to work with. Now, those are the things that attorneys want to hear. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to hear. Okay.
of course, referrals. So if you go to church, or if you go to a temple, whatever religion you may be, all right, you can, there's going to be people who pass away, and these people who know people who passed away, so you can work those people there. And of course, prospecting and also using the MOS, multiple listing service. So why do wholesalers and rehabbers like this area? Because we want to assist the heirs who do not have the time or the money and resources to make their home retail ready. The heirs are very typically motivated because they do not want to hold onto the property because of additional liability. The longer they hold the property, the more mortgage payments they have to make, the, the more insurance they have to make, the more taxes they have to make. If it's in the condo association or homeowner association, they still have to pay those dues regardless of whether or not they, you know, they, they're, um, you know, uh, as time goes on. So the faster they close on the deal, the more money and proceeds they have available uh, instead of having to pay taxes and insurance and also association fees. OK, so here's an example. Now, this may not be clear uh, for everyone. I do apologize for that. But here is a property as an example in southeast D.C., 1208 45th place southeast that we did personally was an estate sale. This young um, this uh, the owner of the house passed away. Uh, due to natural causes, old age, and uh, we have built a really good relationship with the estate attorney, and they just had decided to go ahead and work with us on this deal, and we negotiated back and forth to see what would be best for the estate, but also at the same time, give us the right margins for us to make a decent profit while also mitigating any kind of risk we have. Well, if you take a look at numbers here, on the upper right corner, you may not see it, but we were able to buy the property for $204,500, okay? They re they originally asked for $225,000, but we worked back and forth to negotiate down to $204,500, which was a number that was very reasonable for us and with, within our margins and our risk for doing a fix and flip. All right. Now, going to the very next slide here, you'll see that the property has been fixed up and about uh, we, once we bought it, it took about three, three and a half months to fix up the property, renovated the kitchens, added a new bathroom, uh, added a new roof, replaced the windows, painted the brick, uh, added new hardware floors and all that nice stuff. The whole shebang cost about eighty-five to ninety thousand dollars in renovation. And uh, once it's all said and done, we were able to sell it in the upper right corner uh, for four hundred twenty-two thousand five hundred dollars. All right. So this is an example of us helping a situation with an estate attorney on liquidating probate property, so that way the proceeds can take care of any unpaid debts, burial expenses, and then whatever's left goes on to the heirs of the owner of this property. Okay. So a perfect example of how this worked out. Now, another example of how you can find great deals are short sales, okay? Uh, now, short sales were very common years ago, but there, uh, there's been a spike in short sales again very recently because of uh, COVID and a bunch of other things for those who did not qualify for forbearance under the CARES Act last year, okay? So uh, they lost their job. Or if they're in a situation where their income was reduced, they may not be able to afford their payments and they missed their payments. And there's a list out there that's done by title companies to where if you're 90 days or more past due on your mortgage, then there, you go on the list and you can literally call those people to see if you can help them out with a short sale. So first of all, what is a short sale? Now, purchase of the property for less than the value of the existing mortgage and it requires bank approval. So let's say you have a piece of property right now and the mortgage balance is $200,000. But the house is not worth $200,000 in its condition. And so you offer something less than the mortgage balance and whatever is the difference. So let's say you offer $100,000. So the loss the bank is taking is $100,000. All right. And the banks are willing to do that because they'd rather do it through a short sale than go through the foreclosure process, which now puts them liable for other things because they now have to take title to a property and go through a legal proceeding of officially foreclosing on the property. Okay. So short sales are more desirable for lenders. So the value of our service, obviously, is that we can close quickly. Same thing with buy it as is, where is, and we have to negotiate uh, as a short seller to say, hey, listen, we need to buy as this property at this price because of its condition. And then the bank, of course, needs that justification on why you need to buy at less than the mortgage amount, and which you can easily produce by pictures and by inspections and different things saying, hey, listen, because um, you know, you know, there's asbestos tiles, there's mold in the basement, there's uh, the roof is leaking, the, the windows are outdated, whatever it may be. You justify and say, hey, listen, this is going to be $100,000 less than the mortgage because of that reason. Okay, so the owner of the property would want to work with you on this because they, of course, want to avoid foreclosure. You see, if they have a short sale on the record, it stays on the credit report for two years. But if they have a foreclosure on their record, it stays on the credit report for seven years. And they definitely don't want the stigma of a foreclosure on the credit report because that will harm them and hurt them from getting new credit in the future much sooner. 
Okay, so how do you find this leads? Direct mail, uh, talk to bankruptcy attorneys, all right? There's a lot of different ways to identify short sales, and of course, you can find them on the MLS as well. So I want to share you guys another example here. In this piece of property, uh, you'll see that the um, that when we work with the seller, the existing mortgage balance at the time we met her was $260,000. And that amount kept going up every month because of past due balances uh, for taxes and insurance that kept on piling up and the balance was increasing every single month. All right. Now, when we look at the property, there are a lot of issues. There was mold in the basement. There's foundation issues. The retaining wall in front was not secure and it was it's cracked. You know, there's cracks everywhere. Um, so obviously those are a lot of hazardous things when it comes to safety and health of the new person who's going to be living in the property. So because of that, we're able to negotiate an incredible deal. And you'll see here that uh, we're able to get the bank to approve a purchase for $131,600, okay? Now, the bank did not get that because there was agent commissions and there was closing costs. So at the end of the day, the bank probably netted about $115,000, all right? So they got $115,000, but the balance was $260,000. So you see the kind of numbers that we're negotiating with. There was less than 50% of the balance of the mortgage. So if you know someone's mortgage balance, don't be afraid to offer less than 50%, okay? Remember, these are big banks and they can afford the losses because they're already making tons of money everywhere else, but you gotta make an offer where it makes sense to you as a real estate inv investor to where you can make a decent margin and also mitigate risk as needed, And okay? So moving on. All right, you'll see here that the house was was later on renovated. The, the renovation cost was roughly a hundred to one hundred ten thousand dollars, and later was sold for four hundred thousand um, dollars, and also some subsidy for the seller. So at the end of the day, we bought it for one thirty one, uh, one thirty one six hundred. Put about one hundred ten thousand dollars into the renovation, and then uh, and then sold it for four hundred thousand dollars. So not a bad deal, but we negotiated. It took a lot of work too. The whole project took about five months because there's so much work to do, and there's a very tight space for us to work in. All right, so with that, yeah, that's an example of short sale. Uh, we were sold for almost four hundred thousand dollars. All right, and the next category of what kind of leads are are FSBOs, Okay, FSBO stands for for sale by owner. This is a way for you to purchase directly from the seller with no real estate agents and no commissions whatsoever. This by far is the best and quickest way to get things done because now there's no problems, there's no short sale, there's no probate, there's no legal stuff that needs to go through. It just happens to be a homeowner who's motivated enough to sell at a decent price and you literally can close in two weeks if you wanted to, okay? So the value of our service, again, buy where is, as is, Cash equivalent, no contingency, no commissions, and also very fast closing. Now, how do you find these kinds of deals? Everything we talked about earlier uh, are great examples on doing physicals. You got direct mail, referral, uh, looking up on the multiple listing service listings for withdrawn and expired listings, okay, in the past six months. Driving by neighborhoods and seeing FISBO signs, all right? Divorce attorneys, or you can prospect to see everyone needs to sell the house, but they are the type of people who are DIY and don't want to hire an agent, all right? The great thing about DIYs is that they don't trust anyone to do work for them because they think they're the best, all right? So if you know someone who's a DIY, you know, let's build a relationship to see if they need to sell their piece of real estate and you work directly with them so that way they can feel good about handling and controlling it themselves without ever having to hire a real estate agent and having to pay them commission. Okay, here's an example of a house in Vienna, Virginia. Now, here's the funny thing just down the street was another property that we were that we had bought. And it was we bought it via short sale just down the street. And as we went there on a regular basis to manage the renovation after demolition was done and after we go in to choose the finishes and things like that, we drive by the neighborhood on the way out and notice there's a piece of property that had a FISBO sign. Okay. I looked it up later on the MOS and found out that it was is the same is the property. Uh, they had a physical sign that was withdrawn recently on the MOS, probably because that person was so tired of working with real estate agents because they did, were not providing good service. They originally listed the house for four sixty nine. All right. So later on, I contacted the seller directly, uh, made an offer of four hundred thousand uh, dollars. He countered back, asking for four forty. I said, I apologize, that just won't work. Uh, doesn't meet our margins. So we just left it at that. I gave him a silent treatment. But later on down the road, around the holidays, he, he really wants to get out of Vienna and move out to his other house in West Virginia and said, Can you would you be willing to accept uh, a lower number? You know, like 410 or 415. I can't remember the exact number. He offered another number, but 
Here's what I say. I said, you know, I can't do that. But what I'll do is I offer $400 to $1,000, okay? So you'll see here the purchase price in the tax records that we bought it for $401,000. We renovated it, spent about $50,000 to renovate the house, and later sold it for $570,000. So you see the total hold time between December and June was roughly six months, which is the average time you should hold a short-term fix and flip. In and out in six months or less are the best ideal situations for when it comes to fix and flip, okay? But here's an example of getting a deal uh, just because I saw a Fizzbo sign in the neighborhood, okay? So there's a lot of Fizzbo's out there. Just got to look. And if, by the way, some people might be lazy and say, hey, you know what? I'll just look on for sale by owner.com or Fizzbo.com. Guys, if it's already online, the whole world sees it, okay? Your goal is to be able to find deals where no one else sees and only you see it, all right? This house was in the cul-de-sac. There's very low traffic. I guarantee you, no one saw the feasible sign except for me because when I drive by, I look for these things. Okay. Um, and when I, because I saw that, I was able to make an offer. He was, there's no way a feasible sign will work for a house in a cul de sac lot because no one drives through a cul de sac street. There's no traffic. Okay. So those are the best situations uh, to be in to be able to work out feasible deals. Okay. What's you, these are the different types of leads that you'll be getting. Uh, once you have these leads coming, you're going to have to maintain a pipeline. Okay, because you want to categorize which leads are good, which one are good now, and which one may be good later, or which one are unqualified. Okay, see, once you target here, take a look at this picture. Once you target a market, whether it be a neighborhood or whatever, you eventually will create prospects, and those prospects will eventually create leads. Okay, those leads, all right, will then eventually create qualified leads. Qualified leads simply means that you have a seller who's motivated now and not tomorrow. They're motivated right now and they're willing to sell to you at a deep discount as long as you can close fast and give you a, a, a good value proposition for them to consider. And once that's done, you shake their hand, you sign the contract, that creates an opportunity for yourself um, in this pipeline, okay? And you take a look, guys. Everything that we do is always a funnel. The leads that come in, let's say you have 10 new leads coming on a monthly basis. I guarantee you, if you have 10 leads come in, you're not going to have 10 deals, all right? The 10 leads that come in, you have to nurture them. You have to follow up with them. You have to go ongoing rapport with them and go through three, four, or five exposures and conversations and dialogue with them before they make a decision to do business with you, all right? No one, I have never worked with anyone who decides to do business right then and there after the first conversation. You got to nurture that relationship with the seller so that way down the road, they have to trust you enough to be ready to sign the contract, okay? And of course, as the funnel goes down the bottom, you write offers, but not every offer is going to be accepted, all right? So the more offers you write, the more likely you are to get a deal ratified and a deal that you can work on, okay? And of course, the very last thing is getting deals closed uh, at the bottom of the funnel. But in order for getting deals closed, you got to have leads to come in. If you have leads to come in, nothing else matters in the business, okay? So you got to generate leads and create a marketing campaign and a strategy for yourself to be able to get deals closed after the leads come through the funnel, all right? So, guys, I'm really excited because, you know, in, in 2014, we actually started this meetup group in 2014. Now we have over 1,300 members in our group that share deals with one another, that build relationships with one another, that, you know, they build um, the real estate business in their own way, in their own pace, in their own niche, so some people do buy and hold, some people do fix and flip, some people do title, you know, uh, title work, some people do notes, some people do a bunch of different things, okay? But the great thing about our network is that because of the relationships, when we you when we're out meeting a person before we did this virtually, we will meet other people to help build our real estate team, okay? You never know who you're going to meet because that next person you talk to might be the lead generator for your next potential deal. So that's why building our network and our, our solid place of, uh, of to build our, our network is so important because that's where everything happens, okay? So in addition to that, guys, um, in 2014, we also had such a big request for training, all right? And we actually stopped training in 2020 because we couldn't meet in live spaces anymore where we used to meet in the hotel space or our office and just train 25 or 30 people on how to wholesale or how to fix and flip and give them access to all the things that we use so they can be successful. Obviously, with the coronavirus going on, we're not meeting in spaces anymore. So this is our very first time we're doing a virtual wholesaling boot camp. Here, we're going to be talking about and providing the same materials that we provide in our live boot camps in the past to where people have become successful. 
we're going to be talking about marketing strategies, how to analyze deals, how to effectively negotiate, writing contracts, access to tools that we personally use, and access to contracts that we also personally use. We spent thousands of dollars, all right, hiring attorneys to draft up a contract to make sure it works in the states that we operate in, so that way we can later give it to you and you don't have to repeat that process. Our system is going to show you how to make anywhere between 10000 to $100,000 per deal in wholesaling without any kind of title or buying a property whatsoever. We'll show you how to build a network of buyers, selling your contract, and also closing your deal. Before, guys, we used to charge $799 per, per, per person to attend the live boot camp. But because we're doing this virtually and we want to capture a more national audience because our system does work nationally, not just locally, okay? It is not $799. It's actually only $299, and we're going to show you the same exact thing that we trained in the past. And I'll tell you guys, I'm so proud of our students because every boot camp we've done, there's always been at least a handful of students who get the first deal in three to five months after the boot camp. In fact, I'm going to show you a couple of stories here. Uh, this young lady here, her name is Ethel Patel. She is actually in her mid-70s at the time she took the boot camp. After the boot camp, within the first year, First year, she was able to finish two wholesale deals and made over $20,000 from those two deals on a very part-time basis. And she was semi-retired and also very active in her ministry, all right? Here's another gentleman, all right, who came to our boot camp within the first three months after the boot camp, made $40,000 in a townhouse in Woodbridge. He got it under contract for $75,000 and later sold it for one fifteen, dollars making $40,000. All right, here's a young lady who got a deal Three weeks after the boot camp, I made almost $10,000, guys. I mean, I'll tell you guys, our system works, and these people here, most of them had no experience in real estate whatsoever. So with that, guys, I want to go ahead and open it up right now back to Nicholas and to go through the questions we have. And I was hoping you guys had a lot of questions, so that way we can address them right here, right now. So, Nicholas, I'll turn it over to you. Hello? Yes, Nicholas, go ahead. Awesome. Okay. So our first question is question. <laughs> our first question is from uh, Mr. Leonard Poe. He asks, uh, "What about trust?" I'm, I'm assuming he's referring to the beginning of your slides. Okay. So when it comes to a trust, um, you know, that's different trusts are set up differently in different states. So um, they they're all workable, right? As long as a person controlling the trust is willing to sell you the house at a discount, all right? So probate properties are estate deals, all right? They're owned by the actual estate, and then an executor handles that. But for a trust, you got to have a trustee who handles that trust, but they've got to be motivated enough to sell it to you at a discount, okay? So, yes, I mean, any kind of entity that owns property where they are motivated enough to sell you a discount are deals for you to be able to work with, okay? Hope that answers the question. Okay, and our next question is from Mark. He asks, uh, what script do you suggest and do you use an auto dialer? Okay, great, great question. So we currently do not use an auto dialer because um, the list for absentee homeowners, yeah, most of the time when you're cold calling, if you're, if you're referring to cold calling, we uh, the list for absentee homeowners is not a lot. It may be five, six, seven thousand dollars in any one county. So having an auto dialer system is okay, but you know, the lists generally are half good and half bad. And a person can easily go through them pretty quickly within the month to just decide on whether or not these leads are potential qualified leads or not. Okay. So when it comes to an outbound script, um, you know, first of all, you know, you got to establish that relationship. All right. Um, I am, you know, Mr. So and so, I understand you own a property at 123 ABC Street. Is that correct? Let them say yes. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, uh, is there, and then you, the next question would be um, I understand you're looking to sell your house in the near future. Is that also correct? And then let them answer. So if they say, no, I'm not interested in selling, that's fine. We can put them in that category. But it's like, yes, I am looking to sell in the next six months. Now I can move on to the next step, okay? Remember, the, the, when you cold call, you're targeting absentee homeowners, and the likelihood of absentee homeowners wanting to sell is much higher than non-absentee homeowners that are currently living in the property. So absentee homeowners means that either the house is vacant or the owner doesn't live there and is rented out to a tenant. So if an owner doesn't live there and there's a tenant, there might be a possibility that the tenant is mismanaging the place and they're not paying rent because of the coronavirus or whatever it may be because of the moratorium. And they now have a mortgage that cannot be paid because there's no rent coming in. Okay, So there, we found in the last nine months, ever since the CARES Act, a lot of mom and pop shops for rental landlords, 
they're having they're struggling because they still have a mortgage to pay, but they're not getting rent payments because of the moratorium. So they don't know what to do. We as an investor can easily help move those people out legally by offering some kind of incentive. So that way they no longer have to evict it. Uh, they don't have to worry about evicting the tenant. They can sell to us a discount. We'll take care of the rest. Okay. So hopefully that answers that question. Okay. And our next question is from um, Money. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. <laughs> Um, what if the lease is under limited liability and the co property under personnel to get good rate and mortgage? I'm sorry, can we repeat that question one more time? What if the lease is under LLC, limited liability, and if the property is under personnel to get good rate from and mortgage? Okay. Um, what if the lease is under an LLC? So let's say right now, I'm assuming that it means the owner, the seller is also an LLC. All right. It doesn't matter who the seller is, whether it be a personal person or an LLC, as long as the person controlling that entity is motivated enough to sell you to you at a discount. Right. And then I'm, I'm assuming the second part of your question is, um, which would be a better getting a good mortgage rate? Well, obviously, if, you, if, you, if, it's, if you're buying in your personal name, you're always going to get a better mortgage rate. But you don't want to do that. As a business, you want to have an entity. Um, that controls that business and then have the entity get a commercial mortgage. All right. Commercial mortgage are generally more expensive than residential mortgages. And the reason why is that it's controlled by the prime rate and not the consumer rates. Okay. So consumer rates are generally lower. All right. That the Fed controls. And then the commercial rates are generally a bit higher, maybe one, maybe one and a half points. But if you get a good enough deal, that shouldn't matter. All right. Because your mortgage will be paid off quicker because it's amortized over 25 years instead of 30 years. And at the same time, you're not liable because the house is not owned under your name. It's owned under an LLC and the mortgage is also under an LLC. So the debt does not appear on your personal credit report, which is also a plus because it does not affect your debt to income ratio personally. Okay. So hope that answers the questions. Okay. And um, Diana asks, uh, what local area are you targeting? Okay. So if I'm looking for distressed areas, all right, I'm looking for a neighborhood where the houses are much older. So whether if the houses are over 40, 50, 60 years old, those are the areas that I'm targeting because the likelihood of someone having equity in those areas are much higher. See, the average mortgage is 30 years. So if someone has been living there since, let's say, 1970, their entire time, it's now 2021, that's over 50 years, all right? The likelihood of them not having a mortgage is pretty high. In addition to that, the likelihood of their house being outdated is also very high. So therefore, they, you know, they, they most likely will not... Um, you know, they won't have the resources or may not have, want, have the desire to renovate the house and make it retail rates today standard. And so the likelihood of you getting a deal is much higher in those types of neighborhoods. So, again, look at areas where houses are outdated, whether they're Ramblers, they're Cape Cods, they're bi level, split level homes, you know, stuff that were built in the 70s or earlier, generally a good deal. Now, does that mean that you can't find a deal for houses built after, two, after 2000? The answer is no. We've done some deals where houses were built after 2000, but the likelihood, again, is much less compared to neighborhoods with older homes. Okay. Okay. Uh, she had a follow up to that. She she's asking exactly what neighborhoods do you tend to go for? Uh, by I mean by name I'm not going to mention any names, but again any neighborhoods that you know if you're in let's say you're living in Northern Virginia as an example, you can target areas like in Falls Church, inside the Beltway, Annandale, Arlington. Those houses are generally much older, but they're in high demand areas. All right. Um, where houses are being sold much quicker, uh, if you put it on the market, they generally get the contract within two weeks or less because of the location. So those are the general areas that I like to target, all right? High traffic, high uh, quality areas where people want real estate. There's a desire there, there's a demand there, but at the same time, there's older houses that need to be updated. Okay? Okay. And our uh, last question comes from Su Chen. Um, they ask, uh, for someone very new, how does one get a list of phone numbers for a target market area? Okay, so when I first started, different places provided phone numbers, but nowadays, for whatever reason, phone numbers are harder to come by. But I can tell you guys, you can you can Google around to see where you can find phone numbers. I mean, you have um, you know, if you, if you happen to, you know, let's say for example, let's say you're driving around a neighborhood and you see a distressed house with overgrown vegetation. You see the roof looks very old. The house just looks very unmaintained. You know, there's a lot of seller neglect there. You go out and get the property address. You look up the tax records and get the name of the owner. You can easily um, skip trace the owner's name through whitepages.com or through zabasearch.com, that's Z-A-B-A search.com. Type in the person's name and the city and state where the property is. And a lot of times the phone number may come up to where you can call that person directly. Now, to get a list, you can go to a, a place called listsource.com. 
or you can go to other places called exactdata.com. Um, they provide a list of absentee homeowners. Some of them may provide phone numbers. Some of them may not. But I do know that if there is a phone number, the list tends to be very expensive. So it's not impossible to do, um, but you just got to be ready to cough up some, some money to buy those lists and then work those lists accordingly. Okay? All right. That looks like all the questions that we have for tonight, Jan. I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, thank you very much, everyone. So what we do, guys, next month uh, we actually have – Another topic, and by the way, guys, for those who are interested in registering or getting more information about our upcoming wholesale and bootcamp, click on the link above that says click here, and it'll lead you to our website where you can see a video and some more information about what the wholesale and bootcamp actually offers and what you get access to when it comes to contracts, templates, and other things that we provide in that bootcamp, okay? Again, guys, we've had a lot of success in our boot camps, and we're looking forward to seeing you guys virtually and getting you guys in your first deal in the next three to five months on average after the boot camp. Next month, guys, we're going to have another free webinar, and the topic is going to be how to negotiate the deal and also qualifying the actual seller. You know, what to say to them to understand where the qualification is in the process. They'll get... To get registered for that, go to our website at www.yanlamacademy.com, click on events and then free training, and then you'll see the link at the bottom for February 10th, RSVP there, so that way you can get your security spot before it's sold out. So with that, guys, thank you very much for uh, being with me tonight. For those who are on Facebook, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you guys very successful in your 2021 and also seeing you guys at the upcoming wholesaling bootcamp. Thank you very much.